Assalamualaikum, hope you all are doing well. My name is Shuja Imran and I'm here with a new video. This is a new type of series that I'm trying to develop and we'll see how it goes. Um, this is basically just some ATPL um, questions explained and some topics explained. So I, um, in part time, I work as an ATPL um, theoretical knowledge instructor. So basically teaching the ATPL subjects. Um, I teach flight planning, general nav and um, air law. So I found students struggle with a few topics in flight planning and general navigation to be very specific. So I thought I'd help clear some misconceptions and make it easier, especially for those students who are distance learning or don't or those who don't have access to a full-time instructor. So um, today's, today's video is basically just about basic fuel planning, which comes under section 33 of flight planning. Um, it's basically, most of flight planning itself has a lot to do with fuel, and this is the first step into solving a lot of fuel questions, whereas you break down what is the minimum fuel required according to um, EASA registrations. Um, so I'm not going to go into complete detail of everything about how the regulations are formed and where they've come from. They're basically stipulated by EASA or the UK Civil Aviation. Um, EASA is currently in the progress of changing them. They introduced some new regulations in 2022, which are slowly making their way into the question banks. But for now, I'm going to stick to the old ones since it's easier to understand and then you can go through the differences um, later between the two systems. So, basically, um, if we talk about EASA fuel planning, um, there's a basic dynamic that if you remember, it makes it quite easy. If you remember TT Cafe, which I'm sure you've read in many places, um, it, it basically you can use this format as a table to calculate how much fuel you need as a minimum requirement, and that should suffice for the exam questions. Um, again, as I mentioned, it is slightly changing with the new EASA regulations. They've added discretionary fuel, and they're talking a bit more about energy because of electric aircraft and things like that. But the basic format remains the same. So if you remember this, um, it makes it much easier. Now, the main thing you need to think of is every policy itself has a few regulations or considerations you need to take on board. For instance, what are we thinking in taxi fuel? What do we consider? What do we consider in alternate and how does that work and that sort of stuff? So the main thing for you guys who are solving questions is you need to know the policies by heart. I'll go through the policies in a second then we'll solve a question so you can see it make sense a bit. So as you can see, these are the basic policies um, regarding every section of that TT cafe and how it's solved. So first thing is taxi fuel. Now taxi fuel basically is usually a company standard but it depends on the day. Um, we're looking for fuel for engine start, any APU burn and taxi from the stand to the runway. Um, keep in mind though this is only at the departure airfield and they, they, the, the thing to think about it is if you land with enough fuel, which you should anyways, you should have enough to get to the stand. So we're only considering departure, airport, taxi fuel only. Nothing at the destination and the questions will try to trick you to consider destination as well, but we're only considering departure. For the second T or the trip fuel, we consider takeoff fuel. So basically fuel takeoff, climb, cruise, descent, approach and land. This will be the most significant number in your entire fuel requirement. Um, it must be realistic, of course, and based on the actual route and delays and that sort of stuff but that's what comes under the first T. Um, the first C is contingency. Now, contingency can either be 5% of your trip fuel. So whatever value you work out to be your trip fuel, just 5% of that will be your contingency, or it can be five minutes of holding at the destination, uh, which is 1,500 feet above aerodrome level, which is a figure you will see quite a lot in this fuel planning. Um, so you basically calculate 5% of your trip and you calculate five minutes at the fuel burn rate and whichever is the greater of the two, you consider that value in contingency. There is one um, condition though for a normal fuel question. If they mention the word en route alternate or ERA in the question, that means that you can bring that 5% down to 3%, which is a special approval. Again, not going to go into the details of that too much, but if you see ERA or an en route alternate mentioned, that means you can bring it down to 3%. The next is A for alternate fuel. Um, in alternate fuel, basically thinking about fuel to go around from the destination, to climb, cruise, descend, and then land at the alternate using whatever routing um, is on your flight plan. Now, if you don't have the weather for the destination, you have to consider two alternates. 
Um, if you do consider two alternates, you obviously take the higher of the two. However, if the weather is good at the destination, you can consider one. Um, there is one stipulation though. There, there can be a condition where you don't nominate an alternate. If you don't nominate an alternate, you come down to additional. So think of it as this way. If you have an alternate, you will, will not need any additional fuel. But if you don't have an alternate, if the question says there's no alternate required, then you have to take additional fuel. It's always one or the other. So if there's no alternate, you take 15 minutes of additional fuel. And that's 15 minutes of holding at 1500 feet above the destination or ATOPS, which again is not really covered too much in your exams. So that covers the main um, six initial parameters. Then you think about final reserve. Now your final reserve is the last safety chunk in your tanks to help you get on the ground. Um, that's a fixed value. It can either be 30 minutes of holding 1500 feet above the aerodrome level for a jet, or if you're flying a piston, um, it is 45 minutes of flying time in general. They don't specify um, any sort of holding regulation for the piston. So basically 45 minutes of general flying is what the um, policies mention. And then we have extra fuel, which is basically what you could take on. In the new EASO regs, they've also added discretionary fuel, which is basically the same thing, but it just becomes a bit more elaborate and just clears up a few things. So if you see um, D as discretionary on ATPLQ or whatever the question bank you're using, just it's a new format, which again is slightly different than this one. So this complete set of TT Cafe basically gets you your minimum fuel required. This is how it's done in the real life as well, and this is how you're supposed to do it in exams. In the real life, you some a lot of people do add a bit of extra fuel on, just for various reasons, but this is the minimum required fuel according to your EASA or UK civil aviation regulations, which you need to have in the tanks. Now, for any question, they will give you certain parameters and expect you to work off this basic fuel and get a final fuel figure. So I'll do one question together so you get a sense of how this ties together. For example, what is the minimum block fuel required for a jet aircraft given the following? You have taxi fuel and you have some consumptions in the actual aircraft. Now, uh, with block fuel, uh, you need taxi fuel. Or if they would ask for takeoff fuel, and if the question said what is the minimum takeoff fuel, then you would take away the taxi fuel since you're not taking off with that. But in this case, they're asking for block fuel, so we consider all of the values. So, um, block fuel. So with a taxi fuel of 500 kilograms, I'm gonna write out that TT Cafe format so it helps. We have a taxi fuel of 500 kilograms, which is stated in the question. For the trip fuel, they've mentioned it's 7,500 kilograms an hour, so that's your burn rate or your fuel burn, and you're flying for a trip or the flight time of the actual to get to your destination is five hours and 45 minutes. So plug that in the calculator and you should get 43,125 kilograms. Now the next C is contingency. We said either 5% or five minutes, whichever is greater. So if you work it out, you'd see that 5% comes out to be bigger, which is 2,156. Um, they only mentioned one alternate in the question, so we just picked that as 2,800 kilograms. As we said, it's one or the other. You take additional or you take an alternate. You don't take both together. So in this case, you just pick your alternate and additional is not required. Since we are flying a jet, uh, we said final reserve is going to be 30 minutes of holding above the alternate at 1,500 feet. Um, it, that makes sense because think about if you've gone around from the destination, you have to go to the alternate, so you've technically burned your trip fuel. You should have burned your alternate fuel. And now we're sitting at the alternate, so we're going to be holding 1,500 feet for 30 minutes, which is a final safety chunk in the tax. So that final reserve comes out to be 3,250. Um, there's no extra mention in the question, so you don't need any extra fuel. So that comes out to be a total of 51,831 kilograms. So basically, using that TT Cafe format, um, if you write down a piece of paper like I do, you should be able to work through every element of that fuel plan and work out fuel. But again, as I said, this isn't going to work unless you know the policies by heart. So you don't want to be fumbling around in the exam, 
thinking about what was the policy and how much do you actually need. So if you've got the policies remembered by heart, this becomes quite easy. And later on, we'll talk about in the next video, we'll talk about other contingency methods. So um, they, they have alternate fuel pan schemes as well, where you could reduce the contingency even more. Or let's say you're going to an isolated airfield or predetermined point procedure where we need to think about a point where we nominate and thinking about what type of fuel we take from there because there's not going to be any alternates if you're going to an isolated island in the middle of nowhere. So these are the basic fuel policies. Don't confuse them with the advanced stuff, which you might have seen again, but I'll elaborate that in another video. So as long as you remember these basic fuel policies, you should be good. That's all for this video. I hope you enjoy and make sense. Um, feel free to leave any questions in the comments below. Again, this is a new series I'm trying to experiment with, thinking about if it's going to help students a lot. So if it did help you, please let me know. Um, if there's any specific topic you want to see in flight planning or general navigation, since that's my area of expertise for now, I can make a video and help you up there as well. Um, I do offer tuition sessions as well, so if it's something you're interested in, just leave a comment or send me an email and we can work out something to help you work through a few topics or clarify something that might not be making that much sense. But till then, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please feel free to like, share and subscribe and I'll see you again in the next one. Thank you. A lot of us. Easy 360 on November, Birmingham radar. Good afternoon, Vector Street in LS from your